Well, the holy days are coming up today. We had a, a short deacons meeting to kind of go over some of the planning for the holy days that will be coming up and to talk about things. And so they are coming and uh, it is time that we begin to focus upon some of those things as God's people to think about what God is, is working out. Last week we did an overview of sin and uh, we just looked at sin and and the various things that the scriptures tell us about uh, that particular subject, but we didn't come up with any resolution. Sin is our problem. It continues to be our problem, and it will be a problem until the lake of fire when sin will be eliminated because there will be no flesh uh, left alive, only uh, spirit beings who are, uh, have developed the character of God, and uh, then we'll go forward into a whole new era and span of time uh, as uh, things unfold and whatever God has planned for us. So since we didn't talk about a resolution, what we're going to do this week is we are going to talk about sin's resolution. And, uh, and I've entitled my sermon, Sin's Resolution, The First Step. Because what we're going to talk about isn't the final step. There's more to it than what we're going to talk about to today. But there is a beginning point in which God resolves the problem of sin for all of us. He does it uh, in, a sense, in the sense of taking care of all of the sins that we've committed, and he also makes it possible for us as we sin along life's path uh, to be, continue to be forgiven. So as we ended the sermon on February the 2nd, I asked a question in light of James chapter 2, uh, verses 15 through 17. In, in James, it says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute, of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And the question that I asked all of you is, if in light of what is said in these verses in regard to the destitute condition of a brother or sister, did God have to come into the world? Did God have to come into the world? He would have to come if man was naked and destitute, if he's going to live up to that standard. So is man naked and destitute in a spiritual sense? The foundational premise that I want to start with as we go through this is, is it is God's goal and purpose for mankind bef, uh, to be born into his family, to bring many sons to glory, and it has been from before time began. The whole process that is unfolding here and has unfolded apparently for billions of years has been geared toward bringing many sons to glory. Everything that God does is geared toward that goal, and God never deviates from the goal, and sin makes the completion of that goal impossible because God is not going to grant glory to anyone in whom he finds sin. So one sin eliminates you from being a part of God's family. But it is still God's goal to accomplish that, and we all well know that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And like it says, if anyone says that I've not sinned, you know, as John tells us, sorry, you're lying. We've all sinned. We've all sinned, and, and we are, uh, unfortunately, weak and uh, sinful people. Genesis 3 tells us of the beginning of sin in the realm of humankind, and Satan played a very important part in influencing sin, and uh, as a result of his influence, God cursed him. God cursed Satan. And, um, and, and when you look at Adam and Eve, they were also under a curse. Specific ones for the man and specific ones for the woman, but God said, you are cursed. And was it because God placed a curse on them, or was it a curse they brought on themselves because of sin? Why is life going to be hard for men and women? It's going to be because of sin. It didn't have to be that way, but that's the course that man chose to follow. The most tragic outcome was this, that man was cut off from God. 
Man was cut off from God and access to the tree of life, as Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2 tells us. It says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin separates us from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So we sin and it cuts us off from God. It separates, for, uh, separates us from God. That's not the outcome God wants, but God is, hates sin and will not tolerate sin. But God does love the sinful people. It tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So if you sin, you are going to die. The death penalty hangs over you and there is no way to escape it. There's nothing you can do once you sin one time. There's nothing you can do to fix that problem. You are dead, and there is nothing we can do to fix it. So um, God, thankfully, has uh, resolved the problem for us, and, uh, and that's what we're going to focus on here. So sin became a part of the natural order as the first sins were committed. And let's go to Psalm 51 and look at something interesting. Psalm 51 And, and this is in the context of David recognizing his sin uh, with Bathsheba and all of the terrible things that unfolded. He is acknowledging his sin. He's asking for God to forgive him, asking God to please not remove his spirit. But he recognizes something about himself in Psalm 51, beginning in verse 5. He says here in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. So what is, what is that telling us? So David, as a baby, it says here, I was brought forth in iniquity. So does that mean that you, know, you have this concept of original sin? When you're born, you're already tainted by sin. Is that true? Not biblically. That's not biblical. When you're born as a baby, you are a clean slate. There's nothing written on that page. But as you're born, Satan is a spirit being, and you as a physical human being have the spirit in man in you. And Satan begins to influence you. Satan begins to influence you. And you as a physical human being have, you know, as a baby, you have certain wants and desires. My diaper's wet. Let's get in here and change this. I've got a bunch of air accumulated in my belly. I need you to pat my back and hold me up and let me burp. Those are things, and, and babies cry because uh, they, maybe your diaper is wet and you need it to be changed. So how do you communicate? You can't say, hey, hey, mom, you know, there's nothing, you know, you can't press a button, a call button or something like that and have mom come, or dad come in there and fix the problem. You, the only thing you can do is cry and express your displeasure. Okay, so that's communication. But do babies ever get mad because you don't really take care of their problem right away? They do. They do. I want you to do this now. And see, Satan begins to influence a child even when they're born. He begins to have a certain influence upon them and to prey upon their human, the way God created them, and they're susceptible to sin. He begins to influence them. And as time goes along, uh, sin becomes natural. Sin becomes a natural thing for a child. It's not the way God created them, but in the world in which we live, it's easy. We all become corrupted by sin. So that's what he's saying. I was born into this world. I was conceived, and as I came into the world and under the, the sway of Satan and my own physical desires, then I developed carnal human nature, which is in opposition to God. And um, so this is, this is just the way, the way it is, the way of the world and the way sin works. And uh, so this gives us an idea of the way we are. And one of the things that we have to recognize as we think about the subject of sin it is, is it is fundamental 
to the way we are? How easy is it for us to get angry? How easy is it for us to have a sharp tongue? How easy, you know, trust me, when you call Comcast and you're trying to get your problem fixed, it's easy to be impatient. Not that we were, but anyway, we, uh, it's, e <laughs> it's easy to be rude. You know, when the person that you want to fix your car can't find the problem and you're frustrated, it's easy to take your frustration out on that person, isn't it? That's how we are as human beings. We want what we want and we want it now. So what we have to do is recognize that our nature is corrupted. And we have to come to recognize that and accept that's the way we are and I have to change. I can't just say, well, it's just the way I am. No, it's corrupted. If it doesn't meet with God's standard, we have to change it. So human nature, that corrupted human nature has results. It leads to murder, as in the case of Cain and Abel. As you go along in the first 2,000 years, you find the earth becoming corrupted by sin. People lived long lives, and they were very good at sin. You know, that's the sad thing, is you have a long life, and you are set on a course of sinfulness, and you have 600, 700, 800 years. You can really become quite professional at sinning. And they, unfortunately, were uh, before the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. So God said there's a time limit that I'm going to put up with all of the things that man has going on here. And God, in essence, his spirit was seeking, you know, seeks to lead man in the right direction, and they were in opposition to it. It says in verse, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that, the, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man had become so corrupted, that's, that's all he thought about. That's all he thought about is how to sin, how to take advantage of the other person. You, know, you, you can imagine a world that's filled with violence, filled with people that are predators, looking at their neighbor and ways to take advantage of them. It was not the world that God wanted, but it's the world that came about as a result of the corrupting power of sin. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, it says, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Now, does this mean that God was sad? Well, you know, if that's the way God felt, he could have just wiped them all out and never had another human being. Why even put up with this? I don't even want to have eight of them survive. But that's not what God was saying. He saw what happened to the world as it was influenced by Satan, and as man followed that pathway and the outcome of it, God saw the naked and destitute condition of human beings. And he said, you know what, if I allow this to continue on, these people are going to become so corrupted that they will be irredeemable. So I'm stopping this, and we'll allow Noah and his family to continue on and continue the human race. But these people who have become so corrupted, I love them and I'm not going to allow them to reach that irredeemable point. That's why God was sorry, because he saw how far gone man had become. So you can see as you look at human history that sin is corrupting and destructive. Now the question once again is this, could God as a God of love avoid intervening to help mankind who was spiritually destitute and naked. How could God, as a God of love, not look down and say, you know what, I have to intervene to save mankind? So we see, as I said, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and as a result of sin, as we're told in Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. So as you look at mankind, you might, we might ask, does man deserve God's intervention? Has he earned it? Has he earned it? 
The answer is no, he hasn't earned it. He doesn't deserve it. Man is a sinner and his very nature is in opposition to God. As Romans 8 verse 9 says, carnal nature is at enmity with God. And uh, Romans 5 tells us that Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the righteous. He died for the ungodly. He died for us while we were yet sinners. We were reconciled while still God's enemies. We didn't deserve it, but God intervened and paid the price for all human beings. For all human beings. So God looks down upon this earth and sees it all, the good and the evil. God sees the suffering and knows the penalty of sin hangs over the head of man. And most importantly, he sees that man has no way out. How many of you think that between that mankind is on a course to solve his problems. As you look at the world, is he solving his problems? I mean, as you look at most of man's history, life has been hard. You know, you didn't have tractors. You had a hoe. You had a, 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 a pick, and you dug the ground, or you walked behind a horse, and you didn't have washing machines, you didn't have computers, you didn't have all of the technological advances, we didn't have all the scientific breakthroughs, we didn't have any of that. But once all of those things came on the scene, did they solve man's problems? They haven't. In fact, we know more. We have more technology, more things available to us to solve our problems and to make our lives easier, but we're not any better off. We're not any better off. In fact, Labor-saving devices, devices to a degree, make it e give us more time for sin. <laughs> hey, I don't have to do that. You know, I've got time to uh, do things I shouldn't be doing. And all too many people are following that path. So God looked down on the earth and he saw man's condition. And God said, I'm going to take care of this. And the fact that God was, had a solution for sin is something that God made clear right out of the box. Because as Adam and Eve sinned, and God's walking through the garden and looking for them and eventually finds them, what does he do? You've sinned. And yes, he tells them the negative outcome for Satan and both Adam and Eve, but what's the first thing, next thing he does? He prepares garments to cover their nakedness. Why did they need to be covered? Well, it's a, a lesson. They had sinned, and they needed to be covered. Now, what animal do you think might have been used, you know, slaughtered in order to provide the skins to cover Adam and Eve? Might it have been a lamb? We don't know for sure. It had to be a clean animal of some sort. But God slaughtered that animal, and he probably had Adam and Eve stand right there while the process took place. Because... He wanted them to understand that sin has a price. The price is blood in order that your sins can be covered. Later on, you come to the time of uh, Cain and Abel, and a sacrifice had to be made. Why? Because of sin. So God established sacrifice in order to emphasize to man that when you sin, a price has to be paid. And it was always a, uh, you know, if you understood the sacrifice, it wasn't just killing an animal, burning it, eating a little of it sometimes, and doing different things. All those sacrifices and washings and everything that was involved in that process was pointing to something, the resolution to sin. And the hope was that people would understand the significance of what those sacrifices meant. When you had to take an animal from your flock, which may not have been very big, and you had to bring it to the temple or the tabernacle to make sacrifice, it had a, there was a point being made that God wanted mankind to understand. And that's what the purpose of the sacrificial system was. It began with individuals, Cain and Abel, Noah. They made those sacrifices, but what was it pointing to? It was pointing to the resolution of sin. Pointing to the resolution of sin. Now we come forward in time to Abraham. We come forward to Abraham after the flood. 
about 1875 B.C., God called Abraham out of this world and began to work with him in a unique way. And as you come to understand Abraham, Abraham was called like you and me. And God worked with him like you and me. That's why he's called the father of the faithful. Because he saw things that we all see and we all hopefully understand. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 and look at verse 3. You know, and we all may say, well, why Abraham? Out of the people that lived on the earth in that time. I don't know. God saw something in Abraham that he said, if I begin to work with this man, this man can become a part of my family. If I open that panorama to Abraham, he can grow and he can mature and he can be a part of my family. So he's a person just like you and me, but God called him just like you and me. And he says in, he, he called him out of his, his country, brought him into, eventually brought him into the land of Canaan. And it says in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, when he talks about this blessing that would come, on all the families of the earth, there would be physical blessings. There would be a physical side to it. But the physical side isn't the main point. And we're blessed because of Abraham as people living in this country. But that's not the point. We're just a, we're just a portion of mankind who have received those physical blessings. And because we've been blessed, other people have been blessed. But God has something spiritual in mind more than anything else when he says, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's everybody. That's everybody of every, that's male and female. That's everybody of every race. That's every, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. Everybody will be blessed through your descendants. And, as we'll see, your descendant. So let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Now, <clears throat> what you find in Genesis chapter 22 is God asking Abraham to do something that was, uh, none of us have been asked to do it, and hopefully none of us ever are. But uh, God called to Abraham, and Abraham said, Here I am. And Abraham had been waiting. His whole married life, along with his wife Sarah, for a child. They, they, uh, their faith had waned, and, and, his, and Sarah had said, well, maybe the, the way we can work this out is by having a child through a handmaid, which was a socially acceptable approach in that time. It wasn't God's solution. But it was a solution they came up with, and it unleashed the whole number of problems that are still with us today. But God's intention was that they would have a child. And they did. They finally had a child. Sarah's beyond having children. Abraham's old. And here comes Isaac. And they're, they're very happy and joyous in that. And they loved him. And uh, he was the apple of their eye and precious to them. And then God said in, ver in chapter 22, verse 2, he says, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Here's the child you love. And he says, And go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Where's Moriah? Moriah is where the temple was eventually built and sacrifice made. And that's where he was to go, sacrifice his son. Astounding. But what do we see in, in regard to Abraham? So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took his two sons. So he got an early, he heard what God told him to do. He got an early start on the day and took two of his young men 
uh, with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. He was obedient. He did what God told him to do. It says, on, then on the third day, interesting, it's three days into this when they lifted their eyes and saw the place afar off. So Abraham could see, it was, this was a trip of about 50 miles from Beersheba to Moriah, and uh, Abraham could see the mount, and he knew we're getting close to where the sacrifice will have to be made. My son is going to die. I don't think that's all that Abraham saw, but he, but he knew certain things about God, and uh, he had those things in mind as well. So they got to the mountain, and um, verse five, in verse 5, and Abraham says, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Do you notice he says we? He doesn't say I. He says we. He had confidence in God. He knew that God had the power to raise the dead. If he made the sacrifice, he knew that God could raise his son from the dead. Abraham had understanding. There is a long relationship that's gone on here. So uh, they, he says in verse 6, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and, and a knife, and the two of them went together. So everything you need for a sacrifice. And Isaac notices but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, uh, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? <laughs> Isaac said, Hey, we're missing something here. Where's the, where's the lamb? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. You don't think Isaac's on to what's going on here, that he's going to be the sacrifice? And the two went together. And as you look at what's being portrayed here, this isn't just some ancient ceremony that's taking place. It's a portrayal of what is to come. It's a portrayal in a very vivid, unmistakable way in Abraham's life of what is to come. The Son of God is to come. And he is to lay down his life as the Lamb of God. You go here in verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself. And then verse 9, And they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, and placed the wood in order, and he bound, his son, bound Isaac his son. He bound him and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now you see, was this just some cruel trick that God was playing on Abraham. That's how we tend to look at this, but you have to realize God wants Abraham to understand certain things, and it was only by going through this that God would find out certain things about Abraham, but also that Abraham would come to see the magnitude of what God was working out. So, Abraham raises the knife and he's going to slay a son. He's going to do what God told him to do. And Isaac's laying there as this is going to take place. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and, and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket. By its horn, so Abraham went and took of, took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. So the sacrifice still needed to be made. And God provided the sacrifice. It was still pointing to the reality to come. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. That's a prophecy 
a prophecy that the Lord will provide a sacrifice that will be a resolution to sin. A sacrifice that was represented by Isaac being laid on that altar and by that lamb that was literally slaughtered there as God said, Abraham, don't sacrifice that. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time in verse 15, a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants. So God is saying, because you have done this, because you were faithful in this way, I swear that I will make sure your descendants are blessed. They will be physically blessed. They will be abundant in number, and they will be greatly blessed. So God promises physical blessings to come. And and as he says in verse uh, 17, your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Physical blessings. Then in verse 18, he makes another blessing. Not a physical blessing, but a spiritual blessing. In verse 18, he says, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And Abraham understood this because he spoke the language that God was using. He understood what God said. He said, in your seed. He understood that one of his descendants, one of his descendants was going to come. And through that descendant, all nations of the earth would be blessed. So here we see that God is promising that he's going to bless Abraham. And he's going to bless his descendants. And one of his seeds is going to bring blessing on the whole earth. Now, did Abraham see what God was going to do? Where would you turn to prove that Abraham saw what God was doing with him? Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 51. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 51. Verse 51, here Christ is talking with his adversaries. And he says in verse 51, Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now, is he talking about physical death? He's talking about spiritual death. We all die. It is given to all to suffer the first death. But he's talking about spiritual death And his audience doesn't get it. They say in verse 52, Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you you have a demon. Abraham is dead. And the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. These were men who kept God's word. And they're dead. You don't know what you're talking about. But they didn't understand, again, that he was speaking of everlasting life. Speaking of, speaking spiritually. Verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Who do you think you are making such a statement? Jesus Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. You profess that he is your God. Verse 55, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar. So he said, you know, if I say that I don't know God, or then I'm really a liar. And uh, he says that I shall be a liar like you. I'm sure that was well received, (laughs) you know. I shall be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced. To see my day. He rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And he saw it and was glad. You see, what Abraham went 
through on Mount Moriah, which we are appalled by, allowed him to see what God was going to work out, allowed him to see that the Messiah was going to come, that just as he had laid his son on that altar and prepared to make sacrifice, the son of God was going to come and lay down his life in sacrifice so that all the families of the earth could be blessed. He rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, how could he see Abraham? Because he was God. He is the great I am. And they were just like, oh man, this is just <laughs> off the charts crazy here. This guy's calling himself God. They knew what he was saying. He is I am. And so they sought to stone him. But the point is, Abraham saw it. In his time, he saw what God was going to work out. He saw that a sacrifice was going to be made so that man could be forgiven. And everybody, every human being that's ever lived would have the chance to have their sins forgiven. And, you know, you can go on and look at other scriptures and you find that, that uh, they were fulfilled in Christ. Let's look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Where this point is made about Abraham and Acts chapter 3, verse 22. Acts chapter 3, verse 22. In verse 22 it says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And, every, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So he's speaking of Christ. He's saying... God is going to send the Christ. He's going to be a lawgiver like me. He's going to come to this earth and he's going to be a leader and, a, a, and is going to serve you as a, a prophet like me. He says in verse 24, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. Yes, Moses said he's coming. All the prophets said he's coming. Abraham saw he was coming. And God wanted man to know that sin would be resolved. That's the reason for the sacrifices, to point man to the fact that sin would be resolved. That the price for their sin would be resolved. He goes on to say, You are sons of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. He came to resolve the problem of sin. Now, as you go forward in time, beyond Abraham's time in the Old Testament, you come to the Passover. And this is still a significant ceremony for all of us. It was significant for the people of Israel, but it's still significant to you and me today. And it's going to be significant to people through the thousand-year period because not everyone has come under the blood of the Lamb. Most people have never come under the blood of the Lamb. They're going to need to during the Millennial Kingdom, and they're going to need to during the time of the Second Resurrection. Their opportunity to have sin resolved in their lives is going to come about for them. Now, as you look at what unfolds in the book of Exodus, does it tie back to our original question about, did God need to intervene because of the condition that man found himself in? Look at the condition of Israel. We know that Israel prospered in Egypt during the time of Joseph and for some time afterward. But eventually there came a king who didn't know Joseph. And this king 
said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we are. They're a threat. They are a threat. And what does he say? He sees that they're a threat. And in Exodus chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join with our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Were the Israelites a threat? Or was he manipulating these people? Anyway, they seek to destroy, destroy the, control the people of God. And how do they seek to control them? It says in verse 11, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. They were going to make life hard for Israel, so hard that many of them would not withstand all that was required of them as they were undertaking the task of building cities and doing the construction projects of Pharaoh. So they would die off. They would kill them off, and they wouldn't be a threat. So they, uh, in verse 12, it says, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. They're, we're going to wipe these people out, but the more we make life hard for them, they uh, obviously still have time for sex, and uh, they're still producing children, so it's not working. They made them serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. So they made life hard for them. And then what did they do? Well, that's not working because they're still multiplying, so how are we going to get rid of them? So they said, you know what we'll do? We'll kill all the male children. And you know, if you kill out Israel, what happens to the plan of God? What happens? See, God said a descendant of Abraham would, and, they, and he had to be, you know, Abraham, Isaac, he would be a descendant of Isaac, would bring blessing to the whole earth. So if you wipe out the descendants of Abraham, how is that achieved? You see, Satan's goal is, he doesn't want that to be achieved. He does not want the Christ to come. He does not want those problems to be resolved. So, is, uh, the people of Israel were suffering greatly under all the stress and strain that uh, the Egyptians were putting, putting on them. And it tells us in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, it says, The children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. And God heard the groaning. And God said, Be warmed and fed. I'll see you. No, God didn't do that. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. He remembered what he had promised, and he was duty-bound to fulfill it. So God made provision for freeing them, and uh, we know the story of uh, the plagues and all that God did to allow Israel to be freed and to begin a new life. And as God... This story unfolds. What was it that broke the back of the Egyptians? Broke the uh, broke uh, the Pharaoh's will. The death of the firstborn. And God was uh, setting. You know, as that took place, God set apart Israel as opposed to the Egyptians. And what set Israel apart? Was it because they were such a righteous people that they deserved for God to pass over their sins? They weren't, any more, they weren't any better than the Egyptians. They were a carnal people, just like the Egyptians. The only thing that saved them, as you find in the story, was that they were told to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood of that lamb and put it on their doorpost. And so as the death angel came through the land... They were in their homes, they had eaten the, the lamb, and they were afraid. This is the death angel coming through. And he came through and he killed all of the firstborn of Egypt. But he passed over Israel because of the blood of the lamb. Symbolic for you and me, that we can have our sins passed over 
because of the blood of the Lamb. So we see here that as God saw that blood on the doorpost, he passed over. And that blood was crucial to their being saved. As we look at this, because of sin, man was under the death penalty, and there was no way that man could escape the death penalty. In essence, man owes a debt that he cannot pay. Can't pay it. He has no ability to pay it. Man finds himself under a curse, and there's no way he can remove that curse. God established in Israel the Passover. The Passover of the Lamb was central to the ceremony. And the Passover is celebrated on the 14th of Nisan or Abib between the two evenings, the period of time beginning at sunset, running from sunset to dark. The Passover was a yearly reminder that the Lamb of God would come. Yes, they sacrificed a lamb, but ultimately the Lamb of God would come. And it is a reminder to you and me that that Lamb has come, and he has paid the price for our sins. We've seen that God established animal sacrifice with the sins of Adam and Eve, and animal sacrifice pointed to, at whatever time it was, it pointed to the coming of the Christ. And when the Christ came, there's no more reason for animal sacrifice, no more reason for the washings, no more reason for the ceremonies, no more reason for the temple, no more reason for the Levites. None of it was necessary any longer. So the sacrifices were established because of sin. And, to, and the, they were established to remind man of the price for sin. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, which tells us about this. Hebrews chapter 9 and what Christ has done in regard to this and what these things were all about. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. Hebrews 9, verse 9. It says, It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. They can't make you perfect. They were never intended to make you perfect. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. God put all these things in place until the time of reformation. And it looked forward to that time of reformation that would come with Christ. So, Christ came, and all that ended. It's no longer necessary. So, let's, look, let's think about that time of Reformation and its significance for us. The book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8, tells us the, that it speaks of the Lamb. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Slain from the foundation of the world. When sin entered, God said, then you will, you know, as we planned, you will die. You will die. As you look in the book of John, at the beginning, John the Baptist is out baptizing, and Christ comes up, and what does John say? Behold the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. This is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And as you look at the Old Testament and you see what unfolds, you can see that it's all pointing to this time. The Lamb is here. The Lamb is going to take away the sins of the world. This is the Son of God who's going to accomplish that. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. We'll look at a few verses in Galatians, which help us to understand this better. Galatians chapter 4. Verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, the fullness of time. You see, God has a plan, and God said at just the right time that I'm going to work this out. I'm not going to do it too early. I'm not going to do it late. But there's going to be just the ideal time in the history of mankind when my son needs to come into the world, 
in the fullness of time, when it was the, everything was ready, then the Christ came. It was in the fullness of time. God sent forth his son. God sent forth his son. So Christ said, I'm willing to empty myself of being God and become a flesh and blood human being. And he was born of a woman. He, Mary became pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And it says he was born under the law. What does that mean? What does it mean that he was born under the law? It means that from the day that Jesus Christ breathed his first breath, the day that he breathed his first breath, he was under the penalty of the law. He became a human being. He was under the penalty of the law from the first second that he was born. And as he grew up and as he went through his life, he had to carry that burden with him. He was under the law, under the penalty of the law. He already knew, I'm going to take all of it, the full brunt of the sins of mankind. That's why I've been brought into this world in order that I can take the brunt of that sin. And he says here, goes on in verse 5, he says, to redeem, to pay the price of sin for whom? To redeem those who were under the law. To redeem humankind that was under the penalty of the law. That we might receive the adoption as son, that we might become a part of the family of God. So Christ was born under the law, under the penalty of the law, taking the penalty for us. Not for his sins, he didn't sin, but our sins. And we are under the law. We are under the penalty of the law. And, uh, and he's going to redeem us, pay the price for us, so that we can be a part of God's family forever. We can be adopted as sons and daughters in that family. Let's go back to chapter 3 of Galatians and look at a few verses there. Galatians chapter 3, and let's begin in verse 8. It says, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. See, we see that phrase again. That the gospel was preached to, to Abraham. The good news of the coming of the Christ, for our forgiveness, our being able to stand justly before God. He would justify the Gentiles by faith. Not by works, but by faith. By belief in the Son of God. That he sacrificed himself for all of us. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. That's how Abraham was justified by faith. And that's how we all have to be justified. Verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse of the law. So if you, what he's basically saying is this. If, you, if you're going to live by the law, you have to live it perfectly. And once you sin, you're under its curse. Once you sin, you're under its curse. If you're going to live by it, you've got to be perfect. You can never make a mistake. You can never sin, even in one point. Because once you sin, you're dead. You're under the curse of the law. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you sin in one point, you're guilty of all, and you're dead. You're under the curse of the law. The law, the sin, law is not a curse. The curse of the law is sin and the penalty that ensues from sin. Verse 11, but, not, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. We cannot justify ourselves. We can't be good enough. We will always fall short. The just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. 
again, he's going through and making the point that, you know, you can't live up to it. And if you're good, that's the way you're going to live. You have to be perfect, and none of us can. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law being the death penalty. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ became the curse for us to pay the price for our sins. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Not just the Gentiles, but the Jews as well. All mankind. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That we might be cleansed of our sins in the way opened in order that God could pour out his Spirit upon us. And his Spirit live in us in order that we could be perfected, we could overcome, and we could be readied for the kingdom of God. He goes on to say in verse 15, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls it or adds to it. God entered into this covenant, and there's with Abraham, and nothing can change that covenant. Nothing can annul it. It's the covenant that we've entered into. Verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, And he does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. Through that seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. As you look at the way God works all of this out, and uh, let's go to Romans chapter 3, which to me is a good summary of what God has worked out with Abraham and in all of our lives as we think about things and what God has accomplished. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. Verse 19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So what he's saying is, as you look at the law, what God wants you to understand is that you are under the penalty of the law because you've sinned. The law is saying something to you. You've sinned, and and as a result of that, the death penalty hangs over your head. So it uh, says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty before God. So what he's telling you is that the law exists to show you the way to live, the right way to live. The law is good and just and holy and positive in every way. But the law, as you compare yourself to it and find that you've gone off the path or you've missed the target, tells you that that's your condition. And as a result of that, none of us can boast we're all guilty. And basically all we can do is shut up and see what it says and accept it for what it is. There's no excuse. Well, it was a bad day. I forgot. There's no excuse. There's nothing to say. Verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. See, justification is being right with God. And there's nothing you can do, you know, no amount of law-keeping that you, can, you or I can do to stand, have a right standing with God. Nothing we can do. No, no, uh, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall, shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The purpose of the law is not justification. When you get back to the book of, of Galatians, that's the, one of the paramount points. They wanted to be justified by the works of the law. And Paul, Paul is saying, you can't do it. And if that's the premise you're going by, you don't need Christ. I told you about Christ crucified for your sins, and you're rejecting that and going back to this? What's wrong with you? He was just dumbfounded that they would give up the truth for a falsehood. But it tells us here, you can't be justified by the works of the law. Verse 21, 
of chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. How can you be made right with God? How can you be righteous? We can't do it by law-keeping. God does it through sending his son and his son dying on our behalf and paying the price for our sins. And all of this, as we've seen, was something that began in the Old Testament. God reemphasized again and again that the lamb would come and he would pay the price. The, the law and the prophets all attested to that. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe. All, on, to, all, to all and on all who have faith. For there is no difference. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. No difference between them. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're a Jew and you have the law, you've fallen short of it. If you're a pagan and you don't know a thing about the law, you've still sinned. And you both stand condemned. And you can't be made righteous apart from Jesus Christ. Being justified freely. God extending his grace. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's a gift that God offers to you and me by faith. Being justified, made right with God freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth as a propitiation. He set forth as an atoning sacrifice by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. An allusion back to the Passover and the blood that covered the lintel, the doorposts and lintel of the Israelites, God passed over. And because of the blood, he passes over our sins. He passes over our sins. And we stand justified before him. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So what is our, what is our requirement? Our requirement is to come to, re, to look at the law and assess ourselves. To ask ourselves, where do I stand? And as we have sinned, to come to repentance. To say, I'm wrong, God. I've been going the wrong way and I want to go your way. I want to go the right way. And then we ask God, please, Apply the blood of your son to my sin. And God said, I will. I will apply my blood to your life and cover your sins. And as a result of that, we can stand before God justly. When God looks at us as we've come to repentance and the Lamb's blood has been applied to you and me, he doesn't see sin. We stand justified before him. We have a right, a right relationship with him. Let's look at two final scriptures. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And as you look at, you know, the discussion of the priesthood, you look at the discussion of the uh, the all of the ceremonies and things that took place, all of that, Paul is putting things into perspective and helping people from a Jewish background to understand this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Yes, they served a purpose and allowed people to have a relationship with God but they didn't achieve the ultimate purpose. It says, how, verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Christ makes it possible for us to be forgiven, for our sins to be covered, and he makes it possible for us to begin a new life. A life without the burden of guilt and sin. He allows us to be freed from sin and to begin the life 
that God wants us to live in preparation for his kingdom. The problem of sin through Christ has been resolved. One final scripture, 1 John chapter 4. You know, we ask the question, as God looks at the condition of mankind and, and is challenged with sin, would it be necessary for the son to come? Should he come or just say, hey, be warmed and fed? I'm not going to get involved in this. Thankfully, God did get in, involved. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. It says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us. God looked at us. God looked at our condition. And he manifested his love toward us. Not by talking, not by words, but by deeds. That, the God, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That we might live through him. God the Father had an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. They were close. And a love for one another that was boundless. And for God to allow his son to go what, through what Jesus Christ went through. Are you going to sit there and allow your son to be abused and killed? God had the power to intervene, but he couldn't. Because Christ had to take the brunt of sin, and the Father had to watch it all unfold. That's why Abraham understood how God felt when his son was sacrificed, because he was the one standing there with the knife and agonizing over what he was asked to do. And God the Father had to go through that as well. And Jesus Christ came into the world willingly to lay down his life for me and you. And went through all that he went through in order that we could live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God was willing to solve the problem of sin for all of us. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He was that atoning sacrifice. And as we think about the Passover and the days of unleavened bread, as we prepare for them, keep these things in mind, the magnitude of what God has done and how God planned it all out and worked it all out and made it possible for us to be forgiven and to someday be a part of his very family. What a wonderful thing that Christ has come and through him, all the families of the earth can be blessed.